Hello and welcome to today's video. So at this time I'm going to be taking a look through my vintage Albatross books. Now I've not really touched these for over two years now and in that sort of time my collection has almost doubled in size so I thought it was well overdue for another look through and reevaluate my vintage Albatross paperback. So that's exactly what we're going to be having a look at today. So sit back, relax and let's get to it. OK, then, so we'll start off with the earliest albatross that I've got, which is number two. And you see the number at the bottom of the spine here, very similar to the Penguin books. And this is the orange one. It's a really great one by Aldous Huxley here. And um, the first thing to know about albatrosses, these were not designed to be sold in the UK or the USA. They were for English speaking people um, who were residing in Europe. And they feature um, American and British authors of that period. Um, on the back here, you've got three prices. You've got the Reich Mark, RM for Germany, uh, French francs and um, Italian lira. Um, but they were sold throughout Germany. And of course, people would go abroad. They would pick copies up and bring them back home. So that's how a few of these have managed to get into the UK. Now, it's very, very difficult to determine if these books are reprints or not. You have to be a bit of a detective, really. So if you look at the bottom here, this one's got MCM XXX. Two, so that in Roman numerals, so that is 1932, which is when the list started, and it does also say copyright 1932 at the top there. So we can only assume that this is a first printing, and at the back, it's got just the first 10 listed in the Albatross Modern Continental Library. And you see Dubliners by James Joyce launched the series. And um, it's got ones that are planned coming up. So because there's not many listed, you would have to say that that is a first printing of that. All right. So as I said, you need to be a bit of a detective, but you know, you can sort of work it out if you read all the clues. Um, this is number three here, Man Trap. And a lot of these would end up being published by Penguin or Pan in later years. So this one's in a dust wrapper, but um, you'll notice at the back that it's got a lot more books listed with their numbers so this is definitely a reprint and it may even say reprint at the front or a different impression so this is number three but look it's got lots of later ones there and yeah it, it does actually say in this particular case a third impression but it doesn't always now um most albatross books did come with dust wrappers this is a slightly fragile one and underneath a bit like uh when you do find books that have had wrappers, generally it's done its job and it's really protected the actual book itself. Number six here, Night in the Hotel. And you'll notice straight away that these are all sort of colour coded. So it has got a little explanation on the colours in there. So red volumes are stories of adventure and crime, which is what this one is. Blue volumes, love stories. Green is travel and foreign peoples. Purple, biographies and historical novels. Yellow is psychological novels and essays. And orange is tales and short stories, humorous and satirical works. And they will add a few more colours um, as we go along. So it's probably my earliest uh, crime title. And I've only got a handful of the crime ones. They do seem to be the scarcest of all the Albatross books. There's a pink one there. So they're all, all different colours that we're seeing straight off the bat. Often you come across them with like little bookshop stickers in or stamps so this one here so dawson 13 rue albanon paris which is where it was paris was in the 30s a real literary capital of the world you could say it really really was um so i guess they had lots of bookshops here's a like a blue one here so we've seen all the colors right off the bat here this is a little bit more worn but when you think these are 90 years old now um you have to sort of bear that in mind really you know now, some of the titles are very, very interesting. I think they're fantastic. Um, some of them, you think, well, I'm never going to read that in today's world. You know, it just doesn't appeal. But there's, uh, they've got their selection of books that were uh, classics or became classics later on. And we will see some of those. We'll also see lots of books that were published later on by Penguin and Pam. So once again, it's got that same bookshop stamp there in the corner, that triangular one. Very, very distinctive. That's quite a, a tatty one, that. Um, generally speaking with Albatross, even if it's a book that I've um, 
in that it's in low grade. If I haven't got a copy, I will generally keep a hold of it um, just until a better one comes along, in all honesty, because they don't come along very often. Um, here's a very recognisable name, D.H. Lawrence. I've got quite a bit by D.H. Lawrence in my collection. And we will see one in a minute, but they did start to publicise the list um, to, you know, to, to sort of encourage people to collect them almost. Um, this is a biography of Bernard Shaw. It's in absolutely beautiful, beautiful condition. One of my better ones. Once again, look, it's got that little Dawson. I wonder if they were possibly the distributor for these throughout France. I suppose France is the closest country to England. And uh, people did used to go over on the ferry, even back then, very, very frequently. And uh, I guess could have brought back books which just weren't available back back in the UK at that time. Certainly the, the British publishers were far more precious of keeping books in hardback longer to give them a bit more of a life and earn more money for the, uh, well, for them and the, uh, the authors. Quite a few of mine. I've got that like, interesting book plates in. That's another one with a... Um, a nice interesting one there. Edwin Frankfurter, Library Nouvelle. <laughs> yeah, some of these are also, uh, you know, going through these and cleaning them, which I did a little while back. I did find a few interesting bits and pieces inside them. But a lot of my collection, I reckon half of my, maybe not half, but just under half. Um, this is a nice one. Um, I got in the last sort of year or so, it was a couple of old age pensioners and they were downsizing and they used to be teachers within Europe and a lot of their books were from this period and they were all English language of course um, and uh, they just kept them all these years so I was very very happy to pick up those. Uh, this is a nice one here, Charlie Chan, Carries On, Earl de Biggers, another nice crime one here. Now, around this sort of time in the UK, in fact, a little bit earlier than this, uh, in the late 20s, um, in Britain, the Collins Crime Club started. And uh, we will see a bit of a tie-up with Albatross and Collins Crime in a moment. Now, this is interesting. This is an extra volume. This is like a, a, a double volume, as it were, because it's much thicker in size. And I guess it would have been a lot more expensive. This is just under 400 pages. It's got what is typical of these, is it? The Albatross put one of these in virtually all their books and it's just a little thing saying you know if there's a book that you would particularly like um, please write to us and we'll give you a copy of it there is the headquarters like two rue Chanonis in Paris France and it's got a little thing for you there friends of the Albatross I've never actually seen an official Albatross catalog ever um, I'm pretty sure they did one uh, but I've just never clapped eyes on it So the name albatross was chosen because it's the same word and the same meaning in almost all European languages. So that was why they chose the word albatross. Now, the big thing about these is that lots of people now sort of agree that these were the template for the uh, for the, the penguin books that Alan Lane made so popular um, in 1935. So three years after these launched. And that's what we'll discuss next. Here's another very nice Aldous Huxley here, number 64. Once again, in the dust wrapper, got the little card in there. There's lots of variations of these cards that um, Albatross included. Lots of different colors and things like that. Yeah, so back in 1932, Albatross was started by three men. And it was a uh, John Holroyd Reese. Max Christian Wegner and Kurt Enoch. Now, uh, the name Kurt Enoch might be familiar to some people because after the Second World War, Alan Lane hired Kurt Enoch to go over and help with the American branch of Penguin Books, uh, uh, Penguin Inc. over in the States. So uh, his name was synonymous with publishing for quite a long time. But you can imagine in the early 1930s, Alan Lane, who we know was a big traveler, um, he would go on holidays you know, throughout Europe. He was over there on holiday. He probably came across these albatross books and thought, what are these? These look fantastic. Not forgetting that he was part of a publishing family in the Bodley Head. So he was probably 
always on the lookout for new titles to print at, you know, in hardback back home. But it must have been a brainwave. He thought, look at these. These are fantastic. They're dirt cheap. This is just what I need. Some nice cheap reading. Now, the official Penguin story goes that he was uh, at Exeter Railway Station after visiting Agatha Christie down in Torquay. He was um, didn't have anything to read, so he went to the uh, um, the newsagent stands and uh, couldn't find anything cheap to read. So he thought, I want to produce paperbacks that are the price of a packet of cigarettes of sixpence. However, I think he had these right at the back of his mind. He thought, right... We're just going to go out and out and do a, a blatant copy of the Albatross books. We'll colour code them, similar to Albatross. They're the exact same A format dimensions, what became the A format, very, very famous dimensions. They're very beautifully made. And I think a lot of people who um, collect Albatross books will tell you that they're of a much better quality than most books of the period. They really, really, they're very heavy for starters. The pages, uh, the, the, rather the paper that they're printed on is superb. Very, very high quality. And they are literally a delight to read, like the Penguins. If anything, I think these are better than the earlier Penguins. Um, the Penguin refined their process, um, sort of, you know, 36, 37. But the early ones, I think, are a little bit crude compared to these Albatross books which are beautiful absolutely beautiful so yeah so i think it's obvious absolutely obvious and beyond repute that this is what alan lane based his penguin books on got to be obviously different colors meaning different styles of writing but i think we can all clearly see that uh the typographical cover without the illustrated dust jacket, which was all the rage, of course, with the hardbacks at the time. This was his way of introducing something similar into the UK market. Now, aren't they lovely? Now, here's a couple of crime ones, but this is my first one here, which is the Albatross Crime Club. So they introduced their own crime imprint, part of the main series, the so same style, but um, because they're um, using titles which were published in the UK in the Collins Crime Club in paperback, um, they use the little Collins logo there. And this one did come out. The Motor Rally Mystery was one of the fairly early ones in the Collins uh, Crime Series, right? in the first 50 or so, I do believe. Um, it's one I've, I have got. But this is the, uh, you know, setting for this mystery novel is the, at the Motor Rally at Torquay. This one's actually set in Torquay. <laughs> Yeah, 1933 again. Um, I'm just wondering if it mentions anything. Yeah, look, published for the Crime Club by the Albatross. There we are. So it was a, I guess it was a way for Collins Crime titles, which would have had a hardback run first, then be put into paperback, a way to get them distributed across Europe for the European market. And in this format, there are, I believe, about 10 Agatha Christie's, of which I've got two which are falling to bits so uh, we'll have a look at those at the very end there um, this is a specific card mentioning the albatross crime clubs so that's very very nice and it's in the red the red colors um going through these i found that the, the cards would try and match the color of the book basically and a nice one here a light one here's another um you Although you would think it's crime, it's not one with, in association with the crime club, although it is a Dorothy, Dorothy Sayers title. The Bird of Dawning, this is 214. Once again, this has got a nice, uh, nice dust wrapper on it. So the three founders, um, there was, of course, Tuchnich editions, and those were um, slightly sort of squatter, shorter, paperback editions of great works and they published hundreds and hundreds about thousands of books in fact um and uh they but albatross set out to be a bit more uh of a a more popular and attractive proposition uh, than the touch niche editions and uh, i think they do succeed with that the size was unique and they wanted to sort of uh modernize the paperback format 
on top of you know what Tuchnitz was putting out at that time. Now, the cover design was done by a chap called Giovanni Mardistreg, and he was um, an art director at the Mondoro Italian Publishing House. And that included this uh, sort of new size, which was 181 by 111 millimeters, which is the dimensions of an A format paperback. And it was supposed to be the most aesthetically pleasing proportions, and it's known as the golden ratio. <laughs> So basically, it sits perfectly in the hand. Um, I would say that the Albatross, if you ever get the chance to hold some of these, are much, much heavier than you would think. And I believe that's simply just down to the great quality paper that's used to print them. Literally, that's the only reason. Now, the actual typeface used was sans serif, which once again was um, fairly new back in the 1930s. And that was designed by Stanley Morrison. And as we know, all the books are colour coded by genre. And they have added the greys now to that initial list that we saw for plays, poetry and collected works. And we'll see some grey ones in just a moment. So as I said, although some of mine are a little bit ropey condition wise, um, I'm not overly worried simply because they are fairly scarce. And look at that, you're forever finding bits in these. <laughs> Something from 1979. Some learned notes, no doubt. Another D.H. Lawrence here. Now, because the books were being distributed throughout Germany, it did raise the odd eyebrow with the then emerging Nazi party. Um, they did sort of tolerate them for a while, but eventually, of course, the series did have to just come to a close, not least of which because one of the founders was of Jewish origin and um, had to flee Germany anyway. Um, and this is a a story about the creation of Albatross books and um, their relationship with the Nazi party has actually been chronicled in, in quite an academic book, in all honesty, um, called Strange Bird. But we'll have a look at that at the end. So if you do fancy some additional reading on the Albatross library, um, there is a book that you can, uh, that's, um, I believe it's still in print, or at least you can get it fairly easily off Amazon. And I'll, I'll show you that one in a moment. It's another very nice one. This is the last of four consecutive books uh, by uh, Oscar Wilde. Once again, the, the insert there, but it's in, in grey, in keeping with the grey sort of covers. Now, Albatross itself was so, so successful that they ended up buying Tuchnitz. They bought the company outright, and that then gave them access to a massive backlog of titles. And they did I Claudius, they also did Claudius the God, but I've not got that one. And um, here's a Defy the Foul Fiend. Another one, you know, infamous with Penguin Collectors because it got released as Penguin 666. <laughs> Although Albatross did it as Penguin 267. Good stuff. So we got the two, you've got the main run of the series, and then you've got two series within it, which was obviously the Albatross Crime Club and the Albatross Mystery Club, is what they called it. Now, sadly, pretty soon after World War II started, um, Albatross had to uh, stop publishing. But of course, by then, already established over in the UK was Penguin Books. So Alan Lane pretty much had the market to himself. Um, and so many things were of course copied the, the, into the Penguin book. So they were there. Um, Penguin were more than happy to ship their books over to Europe. And that's exactly what they did. And that was that really, that was the Albatross story until the end of the war. So once the war was over, um, it was decided to try and revive the Albatross in print, which they did. I don't know how many they, they published, perhaps another 50 or 60, maybe a bit more, but I don't have an accurate um, listing of everything that they published, sadly. Um, although there is like a 
a, a roughish sort of guide which I will link to in the description down below so you can have a little look yourself big big thick ones these um, but the experiment after the war didn't really last and there was so much competition by then not least from penguin but pan would, had started um, there was just loads and I just don't think it was a viable proposition so it got knocked on the head then but up to that point I think they're just gorgeous gorgeous paperbacks I really really do I wish I had a few more I don't know where I'm going to stick them um, because <laughs> I need, as it is where these are stored, I've really completely run out of room. And, um, but if you ask any sort of penguin collector, they will have a few albatross in their collection because it's almost impossible to collect vintage paperbacks without coming across a couple of them. Um, this one's really nice. It's one of the few which has got a little illustration on the front. Um, it's the only one I've got that's like that. Um, maybe because it was that travel one in and around Paris. But yeah, a very interesting list, all things considered. And super distinctive to see. Once you know what these look like, you can keep your eyes peeled for them. Here we are, nice Ernest Hemingway. Men Without Women, that's a very, very nice one. Probably the first time that was popped into paperback, I would imagine. And uh, a few weeks ago, I did have all of these out and I gave them all a really good clean. Um, but on the whole, because they're printed on better than normal quality paper, um, they have seemed to have survived, albeit sometimes the covers are detached and things like that. Um, and where the glue has got all like that one's got a little bit of, you know, coming away slightly from the spine. That's just down to the, uh, the 90 year old glue. <laughs> so uh, we're not going to hold it against them. But these are very, very much, if it's a title that you would enjoy reading today, you'd have a really nice experience reading one of these ancient um, albatross books because they are you know, really, really beautiful to hold in the hand. Definitely fun to collect. Um, unfortunately, the crime ones have become quite collectible. So a general crime title, which isn't an Agatha Christie, um, you'll be looking at between five and 20 pounds for one of those, for just one which is a crime title. It's quite unusual because it's uh, cartoons from Punch. Quite nice, that one. Um, and if it's an Agatha Christie title, unfortunately, they do range in price from, I've seen them as low as about £30 for like a complete copy without a dust wrapper. And I've seen them go for about 240 uh, for certain titles. In fact, the first ever paperback of 10 little you know what's uh, was also published as an albatross and that one went recently for i think 237 on ebay so that's one to look out for i haven't got that but i have got a couple of christies which i'll show you in a minute um they're not in the main run and the reason why is because my copies are absolutely falling to bits <laughs> <laughs> but I got them cheap, so I wasn't going to turn them down. And I am actually going to do a little like restoration video because um, I've got an idea about how I can repair them, basically. But these are very, very nice. Another beautiful copy of that one. These are all still, this is dyed in wool. These, I believe, are all still pre... Oh no, this is 1947. Let's see when the first one was after the war, because 1947 is when they came back. That's 47 as well. I wanted to see what the numbering was. That's 47. I know it's around this sort of point. Right, so this one here, number 510, is dated 1939. These next ones here are all 1947. So this is like the second series. And uh, the numbering carries on initially to from 514 there, at least in my, my own run. This is 561. Not, I mean, it says it's an extra volume, but it's just not. <laughs> it's just a real thin one. So I'm not sure quite what was going on there, but these are all... Post-war titles, all of these. Now, this is interesting as well, because look, 
That's the regular Albatross logo. This one here, Liber Marcel Didier, doesn't mention Albatross. So whether that was one of those weird post-war things. Now the number jumps up to 1622, Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Then we got this one in the 3000s, 3527. I said once again, these are all post war titles. 4684. This one's got Oslo. Hmm, it's very mysterious. What's going on? Oh, this is quite nice. It's actually got a little bookseller's receipt there. Look at that. Beidebecker. Lovely. Portuguese, is that Portuguese edition? Is that what that means? I think it might, you know, like an edition published in Portugal. Regular Albatross again now, 5169. It's all a bit of a mystery, isn't it? All a bit of a mystery. There's just not enough research done on these. Arnoldo Mondorari editor, I think that's Italian. Yeah, and it's got Italian price on. 300 lira. I don't know. Oh, it gets you thinking, doesn't it? <laughs> this looks like a, just a regular albatross there. 5248. I don't know what this one is. Leiden. Very, very mysterious. Now that's sort of the main run. That's what I've got in my main, main run. But I've got a couple of curiosities, which I'm gonna show you now. So this first one here is this, which is the Albatross Almanac for 1935, which I think is absolutely gorgeous. Um, really, really like this one. It's not part of the main series. It's like a best of, and it's got the full, sort of at the time, the full catalog at the back here, which in itself is quite nice to have. Then it's got a, quite a bit more detailed about each book in numerical order. And it's got like highlights from other titles in the series, letters to the publisher as well. It's got a calendar for the year 1935 with the star sign. It's really something, isn't it? Very, very unusual that, and uh, I don't know if they did any more of that, but the Albatross Almanac is excellent. I've got this one here, which I think is Albatross related because it's got the exact logo on, but it's published in Britain and it's by Collins. And it's, I think it's something that Collins relicensed back from Albatross and published in the UK. At the time, of course, we know that they were sending them all their crime titles or a selection of crime titles. So I think it was just the reverse. So they um, they got something from Albatross that they then published in the UK. So that is my suspicion on that. And uh, apart from that, it's just a very simple sort of poetry, poetry book. Here is my two Agatha Christie's, my tatty Agatha Christie's. So I've got two. One's uh, Murder on the Orient Express. Missing bottom of the spine there. I mean, fall into bits condition this. I mean, that's all very very fragile indeed but it is still a lovely Agatha Christie with the Crime Club logo on. My other ones were even worse it's uh, Death on the Nile cover detached back cover also detached bits fallen off <laughs> however I have a plan to get it repaired and uh, when I do I shall uh, definitely record the process. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you was uh, that book which came out, I believe it was about 2019, 2018. It's here, it's got Strange Bird, the Albatross Press and the Third Right. It's by Michelle Troy. Um, it's been very well regarded, um, published through the, the Yale University. But I have to say it is quite an academic work still, um, as you, you'll see. Um, it's not what you might want, you know, an appreciation 
or love of the books, but it does give a very uh, accurate sort of history of Albatross. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's worth your time, but it's not, um, I'd almost not call it leisure reading. You know, if you're a fan of vintage paperbacks, there's a particular reason that you are. And part of that is like the design and feel of it. And that, this book here is slightly missing that somehow. Difficult to put your finger on, but it is. But it is, in fact, the only book I know of that's ever been written um, on Albatross books. So, so there you go. Hope you have enjoyed looking through my collection of vintage Albatross books. As I said, long overdue, and I was really glad to uh, to get them out after a few requests on Instagram uh, to have another look at them and, and give them a reassessment, really. Um, uh, they're just fantastic. And I, yes, I'd love to get some more, particularly some more crime ones, uh, if they were ever to come my way, which isn't very often. But anyway, thank you very much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed looking through those. And if you did, do please give the video a thumbs up. Please hit the subscribe button if you've not already for regular vintage paperback content. And I shall look forward to seeing you again very soon. Bye.